Welcome back, everyone. This is Dr. Ribinick. Today, we're going to talk about a very common question for neurologists, anticoagulation after acute ischemic stroke. We'll focus on the choice and timing of anticoagulation, specifically in patients with atrial fibrillation. This video is rated R for clinical uncertainty, complex language, and moderate quality of evidence. So, our objectives for this talk are to discuss the early risk and long-term benefit of anticoagulation, to review the 2018 and 2019 American Stroke Association, American Heart Association guidelines to narrow down the ideal timing, to discuss the stroke and hemorrhage severity classifications and figure out how to individualize risk, to review the expert opinion, the results of our ACT-SAFE study, and conclude with an anticoagulation algorithm and to review a few cases together. I have no relevant financial conflicts to disclose. This is a fun thing to do when you're bored. This is me as a stroke fellow using transcranial Doppler to monitor blood flow to both of my middle cerebral arteries. This has proved that I have a brain and there's actually blood flowing to it. As always, let's make this relevant by starting with a case. Patient VK. We have a 62-year-old woman with atrial fibrillation, who has been off anticoagulation for the past two days for colonoscopy. She woke up one morning with right arm weakness, paresthesias, and right facial droop. Understandably, she became alarmed, woke up her husband, and arrived at the hospital by ambulance. On examination, National Institute of Health Stroke Scale score is 4, and she received points for right arm drift, mild sensory decrement, mild right facial droop, and dysarthria. She's currently over 9 hours from baseline, so she's ineligible for intravenous thrombolysis. Emergent CT angiogram of the head and neck showed no large vessel occlusion, so there was no clot to remove. This patient gets admitted to the stroke unit and receives an MRI approximately 37 hours after last known normal. Here are the two representative axial sequences of that MRI. Diffusion-weighted imaging DWI on the left and fluid attenuated inversion recovery, or flare, on the right. Just to orient you, the patient is facing the ceiling here, and the patient's left is on your right. A stroke that is bright on DWI is acute, and by the time flare develops high signal, that brain is irreversibly damaged. This MRI already shows a completed left frontal parietal stroke. There is no evidence of hemorrhagic transformation. So, in this 62-year-old woman, with atrial fibrillation, causing a minor stroke, without hemorrhagic transformation, would you start anticoagulation now, at 37 hours from baseline, for stroke prevention? Pause the video and say yes or no. Come clean. <laughs> you can do it. Look me in the eyes. Because you're going to answer it. Come on now. Do it. Do it now. <laughs> if you were to ask that question of a seasoned vascular neurologist, Brett Gutierrez at the University of Pennsylvania, he would probably provide you with the following response. As a neurology resident, many years ago, I carried in the pocket of my white coat a small notebook and occasionally amused myself by perusing the entry for acute stroke, satisfying in its pure simplicity. If AFib present, start IV heparin. If no AFib, start aspirin. Clinical trial data soon enough proved this received wisdom wrong. And one of the clinical trials to which Dr. Kuchera is referring is the International Stroke Trial. Nearly 20,000 patients were randomized within 14 days from stroke onset to receive either no antithrombotic therapy parenteral anticoagulation with heparin, or aspirin as soon as possible. Heparin and aspirin groups are plotted on this graph with percentage of patients with ischemic or hemorrhagic events on the y-axis. Parenteral anticoagulation seems to reduce the risk of ischemia, but that benefit is outweighed by an increase in rate of hemorrhagic transformation. So there is no overall benefit of early parenteral anticoagulation after acute ischemic stroke. And early anticoagulation 
may in fact be dangerous. This data resulted in a common practice of delaying anticoagulation for the first week or two after acute ischemic stroke. But long term, the story changes. We know that atrial fibrillation is strongly associated with more severe strokes, higher mortality, and more frequent hemorrhagic transformation of ischemic strokes, probably because those strokes tend to be more severe. Warfarin is like the Great Dane here, safe and effective. It has a major bleeding risk as low as 1.3% per year and a 37% relative risk reduction of stroke over the antiplatelet agent. The Chihuahua here is clearly outclassed. But what about direct oral anticoagulants, like the Bigotran and Apixaban? Here is a nice meta-analysis evaluating the efficacy and safety data from the major phase 3 randomized control trials. Take a look at this forest plot. Data points falling to the right of the midline favored warfarin and direct oral anticoagulants favored on the left. DOEX are at least as effective as warfarin for long-term ischemic stroke prevention, but they significantly decrease mortality, probably because of decreased risk of intracranial hemorrhage. Unfortunately, there's a catch. All DOEC trials in atrial fibrillation excluded patients with recent stroke, anywhere from 7 to 30 days from stroke onset, depending on the trial. Bottom line, in patients with atrial fibrillation, as sure as we are that early anticoagulation is dangerous, long-term anticoagulation is safe and effective. Well, that presents a bit of a problem. When does this early period end and long-term period begin. In 2018, American Stroke American Heart Association tried to answer that question in its updated guidelines. The guidelines state that it is reasonable to initiate oral anticoagulation within 4 to 14 days. That recommendation is largely based on prospective observational data. Here are some examples of these prospective observational cohorts with follow-up longer than 90 days. The Swiss novel oral anticoagulants in stroke patients registry, let's just call it NOAC ISP from now on. This registry included over 250 patients. The anticoagulant therapy for Japanese stroke patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation or samurai NVAF study included over 1,100 Japanese patients and the study of early recurrence and major bleeding in patients with acute ischemic stroke and atrial fibrillation treated with non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants, I think I really deserve a prize for saying that in one breath. Just call it the RAF NOAC study. This study also has 1,100 patients. The frequency of ischemic or hemorrhagic events is plotted on the y-axis. The risk of recurrent ischemic stroke is fairly high, about 8% on average. The risk of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage was about 3%. 8 is bigger than 3, so recurrent ischemic stroke is more likely than hemorrhage. But before you get excited about this data, remember that the patients included in these studies had mild to moderate stroke with a median NIH stroke scale score of about 3 to 8. These patients seem to have been anticoagulated quite early, 4 to 5 days after their ischemic stroke. Also, anticoagulant choice and timing was up to the treating physicians, such as the nature of a prospective registry. It's not a randomized controlled blinded trial. There is bias here. But still, at least we have data that early anticoagulation with direct oral anticoagulants appears to be safe in minor to medium severity strokes. Great! Finally, that magical safe window for anticoagulation is perfectly defined. The talk is over. Satisfied? I don't know about you, but I just have one tiny question. So which one is it? 4 or 14? Those are two different numbers. More than a third of the way into the talk and we're still confused. Ultimately, we have a patient to treat. 
the risk of hemorrhagic transformation in the first week post-stroke is somewhere between 3 and 9%. The problem is that the risk of ischemic recurrence is very similar. Trial data tells us that patients at risk for recurrent ischemic stroke are the same patients who are also at risk for hemorrhagic transformation. So our guidelines are imprecise. Modern randomized controlled trial data is lacking. What's left? How about expert opinion? Worked for steroids and multiple sclerosis attacks? We designed several case scenarios and, by way of a survey, asked the currently board-certified United States stroke neurologists about the timing and choice of anticoagulation. Let's get back to our scales for a moment. It seems to me that, in order to decide if anticoagulation is appropriate, we need to more accurately estimate the hemorrhagic and ischemic risk in each individual patient. Hemorrhagic risk is influenced by stroke size. Here is a useful classification system proposed by the RAF study that we discussed earlier. Minor strokes are less than or equal to 1.5 centimeters in diameter. Here are two example pictures, a stroke in the right basal ganglia and the left temporal lobe. Both of these would be considered minor. A moderate stroke is defined as an infarction of one-third of large vessel territory, or a large deep MCA territory stroke. Here are some representative moderate strokes in the right frontal lobe, left basal ganglia, and the left temporal lobe. Major strokes usually involve the entire territory supplied by a large vessel, or partial cortical in combination with the deep territory damage. Posterior circulation strokes in the brainstem or cerebellum that are larger than 1.5 centimeters in diameter are considered major. Why? Well, posterior fossa is a confined space. Even mild stroke edema or hemorrhagic transformation can really significantly worsen outcome here. We provided a case of mild to moderate stroke in our survey and got the following results. In blue are responses of those who were willing to anticoagulate within the first 48 hours from stroke onset. Orange are those who waited 48 to 96 hours, 2 to 4 days. Green are those who anticoagulated in 4 to 7 days. Yellow are those who waited 7 to 14 days. In purple are responders who would wait for at least 14 days. And in red are those who would not anticoagulate at all. Surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, at least half of the responders chose to start anticoagulation within the first four days, a time frame that is even earlier than the recent guidelines. With severe strokes, only one-third chose to anticoagulate in the first seven days. That makes perfect sense. Large strokes tend to bleed more, so delaying anticoagulation is probably prudent. Large cerebellar strokes are considered severe, remember? So the responses did not change significantly. Besides stroke severity, the other predictor of future hemorrhagic transformation is hemorrhagic transformation on initial imaging. Duh, yes, it is as obvious as that sounds. So let's review the hemorrhagic stroke classification. Hemorrhagic infarction type 1 and 2 are small, petechial, or more confluent hemorrhages without mass effect. These tend to be asymptomatic. On the other hand, parenchymal hematoma type 1, occupying less than 30% of the infarct zone, and type 2, occupying more than 30% of the infarct zone, tend to produce mass effect. These are the hematomas that can cause symptomatic neurological deterioration. And, of course, they're more dangerous. Back to our expert opinions. In cases of asymptomatic hemorrhagic transformation, that's hemorrhagic infarction type 1 and 2, stroke neurologists seem to be rightfully cautious here, and the majority wanted to wait at least 7 days. It's a result that's very similar to the severe stroke scenario. When it comes to symptomatic hemorrhagic transformation, parenchymal hematoma type 1 and 2, with mass effect, it should come as no surprise to anyone that stroke neurologists delay anticoagulation in those patients for at least 14 days. So, let's summarize. Hemorrhagic transformation risk depends on two things. Stroke size, 
with strokes more than half of large vessel territory being the most prone to bleeding, and the presence of hemorrhagic transformation on early imaging, with parenchymal hematoma type 1 and 2 being the most dangerous. Let's put our classification system to good use and apply it to this example. Patient is facing the ceiling here, with patient's left on your right. The first image is a non-contrast head CT, followed by diffusion-weighted imaging, and gradient echo, the most sensitive sequence for hemorrhage. Is this a mild, moderate, or severe stroke? And what's the degree of hemorrhagic transformation? I hope you said that this is a severe stroke because it involves a large territory of the right middle cerebral artery, a combination of cortical and deep ischemia. There is also mild hemorrhagic transformation. I would score that as hemorrhagic infarction type 2. It is only faintly hyperdense on the initial CT scan and much better seen on gradient echo sequence. We can now predict the risk of hemorrhagic transformation but predicting ischemic stroke recurrence risk is more challenging. We gave our experts a list of embolic sources, acute left ventricular thrombus, mechanical heart valve, left atrial thrombus, left ventricular assist device, patent foramen ovale with above knee deep venous thrombosis, and left atrial spontaneous echocontrast, or smoke, which is thought to be a precursor to clot, and asked, which of these were perceived to be more dangerous and would push them to anticoagulate earlier than they typically would? The top embolic sources to fear were cardiac thrombi, mechanical heart valves, and left ventricular assist devices. That was a long detour. Let's get back to our patient. As a reminder, this is a 62 year old woman with minor stroke due to atrial fibrillation and without hemorrhagic transformation, known cardiac thrombus, or PFO. Which risk is higher, hemorrhage or ischemia? I'll leave you to think about that one for a moment. This is a small stroke. Remember that about half of stroke neurologists would anticoagulate a small stroke in the first four days. But based on the guidelines, at this point, 37 hours from symptom onset, our patient falls in the red. So, her treating physicians chose to withhold any coagulation. Fast forward in time to 58 hours after last known normal. She suddenly develops global aphasia, right gaze deviation, right hemiplegia, and right field cut. NA stroke scale score is 17. Urgent CT angiogram showed acute left middle cerebral artery occlusion. Unfortunately, the patient was in a hospital not equipped for mechanical thrombectomy, so there was a delay in stroke intervention because the patient had to be transferred to another center. MRI was repeated at 65 hours after last known normal. You can see diffusion-weighted imaging and gradient echo sequences here. Now, unfortunately, our patient has a large stroke affecting the entire territory of the left middle cerebral artery. Gradient echo showed no evidence of hemorrhagic transformation. It seems that those stroke neurologists that chose to anticoagulate minor stroke earlier might have been right. At this point, since our 62-year-old woman with a fib now had a major stroke, anticoagulation had to be withheld until day 7 after repeat stability head CT. And here's our final algorithm. If you have an atrial fibrillation patient with signs of acute ischemic stroke, first, acute stroke care should be performed in accordance with the guidelines until clinical stability is established. Then, we need brain imaging preferably an MRI which is more sensitive than the CT, especially for hemorrhagic transformation. Based on the MRI, 
we can decide on the hemorrhagic risk by estimating ischemic stroke severity and hemorrhagic transformation severity. DWI negative patients, also known as trained in ischemic attacks, they have a pretty low risk of hemorrhagic transformation since there's no damaged brain to hemorrhage. They can be anticoagulated within the first 48 hours of symptom onset, right away. Recommendation stays about the same for minor strokes. Remember those are strokes less than 1.5 centimeters in diameter without hemorrhagic transformation? With moderate strokes, affecting less than one-third of the territory of a major intracranial vessel, it is prudent to wait 48 to 96 hours, or 2 to 4 days. If a moderate stroke has even a small degree of hemorrhagic transformation, anticoagulation should be delayed until 4 to 7 days after stroke onset. Whether it's 4 or 7 will depend on patient stability and other clinical factors, like the need for PEG-2 placement in a stroke patient that's unable to swallow. For severe strokes, involving more than one half of the territory of a major intracranial vessel or more than 1.5 centimeters in the posterior fossa, anticoagulation should be withheld for at least a week. It may even be reasonable to wait two weeks depending on the stability of the patient and any necessary surgical procedures. We expect a large percentage of major strokes to have some minor asymptomatic hemorrhagic transformation. There's a lot of necrotic tissue to bleed. So, the presence of hemorrhagic infarction type 1 and 2 will not change matters. And finally, the most obvious recommendation. Patients with severe strokes with major symptomatic hemorrhagic transformation should certainly not be anticoagulated for at least two weeks. Randomized controlled trials are coming soon to help answer this important clinical question and to put the four larger trials into a table. These trials will include several thousand patients each with strokes of various severities and varied anticoagulation timing, and we expect data in about one to two years. And that's all. But there's just one more thing. Let's pretend that you are the stroke expert and review some cases. We have a 67-year-old man with atrial fibrillation, hypertension, dyslipidemia, who developed acute left arm numbness and mild left neglect. NH stroke scale is 2. He presented outside of the IV TPA window and there was no large vessel occlusion. MRI was obtained 48 hours after symptom onset, and here it is. This patient has atrial fibrillation. So when would you anticoagulate this patient for secondary stroke prevention? Within 48 hours? Now. 48 to 96 hours? 2 to 4 days. 4 to 7 days? Wait 1 to 2 weeks? Wait over 2 weeks or would not start any coagulation? Pause the video now and give yourself an answer. Well, this is a moderate stroke with hemorrhagic infarction type 1, which is asymptomatic. So waiting four days is reasonable. What about this case? 86-year-old woman with coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, who developed acute transient right-hand clumsiness. NIH stroke scale score is zero. She did not receive TPA because her deficits resolved. Needless to say, there was no large vessel occlusion. Atrial fibrillation was picked up on the monitor in the emergency room. MRI was obtained 24 hours after symptom onset. Same question. Anticoagulate now, within 48 hours. Wait 2 to 4 days. Wait 4 to 7 days. Wait 1 to 2 weeks. Wait over 2 weeks or would not start anticoagulation at all. Pause the video. Give me an answer. So, as the MRI showed, this is a minor stroke without hemorrhagic transformation. It is reasonable to anticoagulate early. Now is as good a time as any. Last case. 57-year-old man with atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation held for colonoscopy. He develops acute left ataxia. NIH stroke scale score is 2. He received IV TPA within a standard window, and there was no large vessel occlusion. After an uneventful 24-hour post-TPA course in the ICU, MRI was done at 36 hours after symptom onset. When would you anticoagulate? 
remember that in the classification scheme that I presented, brainstem and cerebellar strokes that are more than 1.5 centimeters in diameter are considered severe. The risk of hemorrhagic transformation of these strokes is not particularly high, but they're classified as severe because even small amounts of hemorrhagic transformation may potentially worsen outcome. That's it. Go forth and anticoagulate responsibly. Thank you.